and you know this guy just comes in yelling and Chris Hardy. (laughs) 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 It ended up being Mike Burke. Bro. (laughs) So what's up, brother? Not much. Came down for your birthday. I know, man. I thought you were turning fifty, and if I knew it was forty-nine, I would have stayed home. But well, you know. Uh, you thought I was turning 50. Uh, I'm turning well, you look 55, so I was going to compliment hey, you on 50. But hey, the Botox has wore off, and, <laughs> um, you know, I haven't got lip injections in a while. So, the, uh, But, yeah, I'm 49 years old today, man. Congratulations, Thank man. you, brother. You've accomplished it. a lot. Uh, yeah, thank you. You ever think about that? About like, what? It, it, well, oh, so you look at people that are successful, and for me, as we've gotten older, I start to evaluate my age. Like having a business when you were 30 was like, wow. You know, I remember, you know, as I was dating or buddies, they're like, wow, you have your own business. Well, at 40, 45, I mean, you're Elon Musk's, you start like comparing yourself to, or, or oh, looking Lord. at people that are very, very successful. And you're, and then I look at an age factor. So I look at what you've accomplished and you're not even 50 yet. I mean, i and I feel like you're in your prime. I believe I'm in my prime. I, you know, you hit the nail on the head. I feel like I've learned a lot from the mistakes in my life. And, uh, you know, in the last couple of years, we've known each other. How long? How long has it been? Uh, how long has it been? five, five, five years. five years, something like that. Five years. How did we meet? We met at uh, a conference uh, at Expel. In fact, as I've talked, now that I work for Expel and I tell people they should go to these conferences, I have all my business connections and relationships largely, at least in this industry, have been created from that conference. So we met at a conference where um, uh, we were just all out chatting because we do a lot of networking and guys are talking and we know some people we know, you know, and we don't know others and you were standing there and I think I'm pretty sure that I, uh, you know, leaned forward and said, Oh, Hey, I'm, uh, I'm, you know, Chris West because you were a loud boisterous guy. So I'm like, this guy, you know, my sounds like I need to get to know him and to which you, and then I said, and who, you know, who are you? And you said, you don't know who I am. And I said, ah, no, sorry, I don't. And then you said, I'm Mike Mother F and Burke. <laughs> and, you know, I, I have to do this G rated for YouTube, but you didn't say Mother F and. No, I know. Uh, I know. I know. We're going to go on YouTube. So we're trying to keep the, uh, the verbiage down just a little bit. It's not in our normal tone, but yeah, the, um, that was, I remember that day. It was, uh, you know, everyone knows who you are, man. You're the five time X Bell champion of PPF. If you're in this industry at, all your name is always coming up as the godfather of the you know paint protection and uh i think I secretly i was telling myself we were just discussing this today we're, we're in the the studio today we have uh danik from eurotech who came in for my birthday and then mike uh is his partner up there and they're they're my close friends and we're all sitting here in the studio together doing our very first podcast and I welcome you guys. Thank you for coming over here, everybody, and supporting me and everything that we're doing. Um, but I remember that day, and we were talking in the truck about this earlier today, and it was more some clarity on my end where it was like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm Clear Brock Chris, and it's, uh, you know, I, how are you? Who are you? And I'm like, I'm trying to basically go one up you <laughs> and go like, hey, I'm Mike Burke. Like You did it. <laughs> I mean, not only are you, what, 6'2", two, 2", whatever, but then yeah. you had to come at me like that. Yeah, I had to come at That's you. It's a little but, intimidating. Yeah, it's all right. You know, I don't have PPF skills like But you. ironically, as we say, you know, as you find people that meet you, we've talked about this a lot because we're good friends, uh, very close friends, uh, now that the initial reaction generally is like, who does this guy think he is? It's a little defensive, you know, like, you know, he's, he's one of those loud, cocky, big dudes, you know, overpowers everybody. And then, and I was telling you this earlier today that 99% of the time by the second, for sure, the third or fourth time of hanging out with you, it's like the genuineness, the the love that you have for people, that you care, that you want them to be better people starts to come through. And then people say, love him. Well, you know, in life, we have stories. We all have stories of how we grew up and how we, you know, trans, you know, to get where we are today. Um you know, you build up like an immune system, I guess, you know, your body builds up an immune system towards people. I was telling somebody one day, I was like, you know, I'm a lollipop with like the gum in the middle. It takes like three bites to get to the to the candy in the middle. If the people can take the time 
and the effort. It's like a girl. If you go on a first date and she gives it up on the first date, you're going to really date her, marry her, and she's going to be your wife? I mean, is that really what's going to happen? True. You don't know that. So I look at it like, you know, it's going to take a couple of dates. You know, you want to date me? I'm dating you. I look at guys, girls. doesn't matter who's in your life. I look at it as a building relationship. And if someone's going to make the effort and I'm going to make the effort, then it's got to be some value there. Yeah, for sure. You know, and um, I feel like I don't want to give it all away the first date. You know, I want people to go, okay, I want to get to know this guy. Who is he? What's he stand for? What's his value system? What what value can he add to my life? And I think that's why you just said it takes one, two, three, four times. And that's just a mental. I didn't realize this until probably today, but that's what I've done. And I built up this kind of like I'm dating whoever I meet for the first time. I look at like a first date and I like to be noticed. I like to be remembered and I like to do funny, obnoxious things to basically lighten the mood. And I don't know if it's an intimidation thing on, or a um, insecure thing on my uh, behalf, but it's like when I get around people I respect, I turn around and sometimes, you know, obviously we all get nervous. You, right. know, you meet yeah. somebody for the first time, you're like, oh, this dude's somebody or he's a somebody. Yep. And then all of a sudden it's like I turn into the jokester. I turn into the I'm Mike Burke. Yeah, I turn yeah, into a yep. character like yep. I'm a wrestler. But you're like you're a big <laughs> imposing like guy. So it doesn't cut. You don't you don't. Yeah. Your presence doesn't look like the joking uh, guy. Yeah, so I it's like, ah, it. oh, this is the bully, which is ironic because you and I have talked about that back in the day. Yeah. You were the guy. That, I was uh, not getting picked on. Yeah. Yeah, I was a it, fat kid growing exactly. up. Exactly. And so uh, because of that, like, you know, it's funny where I like you're so big and, and, and boisterous that it, it's like, oh, you big Mike Burke the bully. Not at all. You're actually the guy that stood up for people. Yeah, I did. After I got picked on, man, I just kind of built up this immunity of trying to help people. And it's still in me. You know, I, I don't like to see anybody get picked on or bullied on. And then when it comes to business, man, I don't know if you knew this or not, but I was very dyslexic. I didn't learn how to read till very later in life. My mom, you know, helped me out trying to get me tutors and trying to get me help in school. But I just had major learning disabilities. Mm. I was very ADD. I was always looking outside. I was always coloring. I was always bouncing my foot. I was always biting my fingernails. I had nervous energy. And oh, I don't wow. know really, you know, how to, to control nervous energy. I can see that. And so what happens is, is when you get nervous energy now, I can, what's called hyper focus. Um, when I found window tinting, uh, I found it as a, a tool. Like I, I got zoned out. I don't know if you ever see like a musician, you know, they're playing a guitar and they're just zoned out. They're not paying attention to the crowd. They're not yep. doing anything. They're just in the zone. Basketball players, football players, they get in a zone. And uh, I think what happened is I found something I got in the zone. And I'm sure you're the same way when it comes to paint protection, you get in a zone. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, when I think people ask me, you know, well, at least you do what you love. And now granted, uh, I would much rather do what we do than flipping a burger. Are the things that I enjoy more than window tinting, paint protection film? Absolutely. But it's something that I'm very good at. I do enjoy. And when you have a skill set that you, th you know, you thrive at and that you can take pride of, like I, it's a very satisfactory um, feeling for me to do good work. Uh, I used to laugh because back in the day when I owned my shop, because I've since sold it, uh, I used to do a big job. And then I had a front person or a manager, and I would see in my cameras in my office that they, they were picking up. And if it was a car that we had done or I had done, I would walk up front and I wouldn't ever ask or say, like, did they pay? You know, it, it was a check, was it cash? My Every time I said, what did they say? Did they like it? The, Were they happy? Yeah, yeah, yeah gratitude. Every time. And that was so much better than them saying, oh, we made 10 grand on that job. It yeah. was like, oh, he couldn't, he's so excited. He already posted on his Facebook. That was way more rewarding to me. The gratification, I really love it. That's what we were talking about earlier today. Why we do what we do is, you know, customers thank us. They're like, oh, my car looks great. You get that excitement. They post pictures, they tag you. Everything's super cool. Let me ask you a question. When did you start in uh, window tinting paint protection and wraps in Alaska? Like what, what year? Well, how long ago was that? It was 03. 03. So I was a civil engineer. I went to school uh, at a university and got a civil engineering degree. 
and then left. My plan was to come back to Alaska where I already had connections because that's where I was from. And I was going to work at a firm. We did, uh, you know, airports, bridges, all your civil engineering type uh, projects. And so I was going to work for them for four years uh, because at four years you can then take your test to become a professional engineer and then you make more money. And I and then I plan to leave uh, state, either open my own firm or work somewhere else. Well, at year three of this four years of working for this firm, before I could take my PE uh, test, I bought a new Audi. And I, the roads up, you know, obviously Alaska is pretty, you know, rough, a lot of gravel roads, a lot of just, we, we gravel in the winters as well and put down, I, I mean, damn near pea gravel size uh, rock. So I needed to get some protection. All I knew was the cloth black bras from the eighties. Oh yeah. That's what I, uh, yeah, the Corvette, I remember knowing. the old yeah. silverhead guys. Yeah. The I thought they were Corvette. cool. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So I bought yeah. a red Audi and was planning to put a black cloth bra on. It was oh, going to wow. look awesome. And, uh, I had a guy, a friend of mine from Denver that said, you got to check out this 3M clear bra stuff. And uh, he told me about it. And I was like, oh, that sounds pretty cool. And Colorado is kind of the state that that started, not started, but there, Utah, Ricochet had some of the first products for paint protection film and really pushed it with high penetration. So I researched it. At that time, it was like a lot of Lamborghinis, Ferraris. You could look in DuPont registry and see guys advertising it. So I was like, oh, this can't, you know, this. I don't think this is snake oil. It sounds legit. So I went and got trained by Expel back then. Uh, it was, you know, just small little facility, few few guys. I mean, I don't think Expel had more than 20 people that worked for it, if not less. Um, and they used 3M back then. But I got trained, came back, and the plan was to open a shop, hire a bunch of guys, and still be an engineer. Mm -hmm. Because it was a great career. I enjoyed it. Uh, good salary, benefits. Well, it's very labor-intensive, obviously, and requires a... a skill set that isn't just, oh, I learned and now I'm going to train you and now you run a business for me. Because uh, I was very business minded. I didn't go into it. I mean, I loved cars, but I didn't go into it for uh, the, the skill passion side of it. It was for a business. That's what I wanted to do was just, I like business stuff. And, but as I got good at it myself and tried to get my reputation out there because it was non-existent, nobody knew about uh, Clearbra. Uh, I was working nights, weekends, lunchtime, and I finally pitched my first dealer group because where we had zero penetration in Alaska, nobody knew about the product. It was obvious that if I went to dealerships and got them to sell it, it was like I had a whole sales team now, right? That mm -hmm. was now educating about the product. Even if even if people didn't purchase it from the dealership, the fact that they heard the name because I called it Clear Car Armor, that was the name of my business. So when I went to the Honda dealership, I didn't sell them on 3M Clear Bra. Yeah. I sold them on Clear on Car name. Armor right. and branded it as that because I wanted everybody to think that that clear car armor was the product and that was my business that was good so uh very good marketing yeah yeah so it, it but it got busy i this dealer group had five dealerships and my my engineering manager or boss said hey you need to make a decision and i was like i was super defensive like why i already i get my work done you know yeah, he's yeah, like because yeah. you're killing yourself like i was literally working you know sleeping three hours a, a, a night type thing so i chose the the shop, I sold my house, I sold the rental property, cashed out the 401k, got the shop, and then lived on a mattress in the corner for like a month while I figured out where to live. And I would do cars. And like, literally, I remember pulling in like the, the head of the, the Euro club, and I pulled in his brand new Lotus. And he was like, um, is that your dresser drawers? Because it was I was still living out of the shop. And I just pulled it in and did it, and it was, it was a small town, so it, everybody was fine with it. But anyway, slowly grew it, uh, hired employees pretty quickly, and then uh, added services, you know, picked up Tint a couple years later. Because any service that somebody else was doing that I was subbing out, I was like, well, I want to do this. And in fact, I had a good conversation with Danik earlier today about how I, at one point, tried to do every service. I mean, I was doing stage three build mechanic stuff on Subarus, we try to do everything. And then at a certain point, I had to look at my margins and what was costing me money and the liability that comes with a lot of these yeah. builds. And then I, I, I backed it down and said, let me focus on some core services. It's okay to let some business leave my shop. Cause yeah. at one point in time I was like, I'm going to do it all. How long did it take you to figure that out? Too long. Too long. Um, 
probably six or seven years. And the reason that it took that long was because I was working in the business. So I didn't, when you're busy and you're an owner operator, you're doing the installs, a month goes by and your books are behind. You didn't look yeah. at this. Your marketing isn't there because you're installing. Yeah. So, so when did you actually transition from not installing as much to actually managing? Again, way too long. Uh, it was probably, I started trying to do it probably like 12 or 13 years into it. Um, because a super OCD, the, a big problem with owner operators is they establish their business and their reputation built on their own skill set. Mm. So as they hire people and hire managers, they still micromanage that process and they can't grow the business because they either will do the work themselves or they're, you know, they're still controlling too much. So I was doing that and it, and it wasn't growing. Was your employees intimidated by you? Like, did you set a bar so high that they couldn't reach? I mean, you know, I look back and when I first got in this business and like, I let things go a little bit. Like early on, I was like, hey man, that'll pass. Don't worry. You know, if, we, if you know, I had a restaurant manager one time tell me this and I, and I don't know if this is the right thing to say, but it was a Ruth Chris. It was a guy I met and he was telling me, he's like, we allocate 3%. Um, for returns for like mm. steaks for like the cook. So, yeah. And then he goes, he goes, what do you mean? And he goes, well, he's like, bro, if you're not getting steaks returned, you're not cooking enough steaks. 100%. And I go, wow. Okay. So that kind of stuck with me really, really early on in my career. And I said, okay, well, we've got to let a few things go out the door. Oh, so true. And if we don't let a few things go out the door, we're not going to make money. And if I'm OCD taking note, you know, checking this, checking that to the point where it's taking me all day to get a car out of the shop, um, that's kind of helped me. I think learning from other rest, like <clears throat> I look at my world or your world and I go restaurants, high volume, high stress, and we can get stressed in our shop, but the car's in there and it's on our time, our schedule. People are waiting on their food. They got the waiters, you got the cooks. And this guy's over there telling me that, yeah, it's the high end restaurant. We got $40 steaks and we allocate 3% of all of our steaks that we cook to come back. And that's in our budget. I thought that was pretty cool. Well, it's crazy. I mean, you, you do business coaching. I've done uh, consulting too, because first of all, we, we like to do it because we realize that a lot of guys are good installers, but they're not the great business uh, guys. Right. And it's okay to admit that. I admitted that back in the day. And it's just like we go to get trained for bra and for paint, protect, you know, uh, for PPF and for window tint. Why wouldn't we get trained to be, if we're not a good business, if we're not a good window tinter, we get trained to be a good window tinter. Sure. If we're not a good business guy, it's okay. Get trained to be a good business guy. And, but where I was going to go with that is that, uh, on the business side, you're 100% right. Is that if, so with that mentality, if you're in it, if you want to, I'm okay with the guy with the business model that he isn't worried about making a paycheck and about making a million dollars. He's all about, uh, passion and making the, doing the best work. That's fine. But that's a certain business model. I don't, that can be a profitable Business model focused on making money, but a lot of times from what I've seen and all, and I don't know about you, but from all the traveling I've done, it, it usually isn't because the 3% rule. In mm -hmm. fact, I might even call it that from now on, yeah, 3%. the 3% rule. Yeah, I like that. Because my, my brother is the same way. He's uh, did He does uh, uh, hobby uh, cards and collectibles on eBay, one of the largest there is on, on a wholesale side. And one time I said, well, what are you doing all day? He worked like a 15 hour all day. And he's like, I'm responding to negative reviews on our account. And I said, oh, you get negative reviews because in our business, right? One, uh, like a one star review is the end of the world. And he goes, well, yeah, I mean, that's part of the business. And I go, oh, not mine. I don't have any. And he goes, well, then you're losing money. Yeah. He said it very matter of factly so like that. Here's the thing. Going with that, I was at a conference and uh, Josh Popnick was um blackout tinning yeah yep. blackout he's a super guy super aggressive i love the guy um we've actually become pretty good friends and uh he calls me from time to time like he called me one night it was like 10 30 at night and he's like i don't need a fucking thing man just calling to say what's up how you doing <laughs> how many stores you got now you know <laughs> just that little pep talk you yep. know and um 
so he's growing, and um, you know, people are starting to see the Sunstoppers locations grow. And I know Ray Van Dexter, um, four or five, three, four years ago, called me with Hardy, and he was looking to get a second location. I kind of mentored him and told him what I do, and he, I think he did it. Now he's on his way to this third, third location. And I, I oh, love Dex- Ray. Ray, yeah, oh, he's killing yeah, it. Yeah, I love him, man. He's yep. a great guy. But he's one of those dudes that called me early on and asked me for some advice on how to scale and how to get a second location. And I gave it to him and, you know, literally we're, you know, he was in New Jersey or New York or something. And, uh, it was just nice that someone was calling me for advice Yeah, and I would, and I gave him the advice and he did it. That that's what makes me so proud is that people actually listened, they implemented it, they did it. And then we saw each other a year or two later, he gives me a big hug and he's like, I think I'm opening my third store. I said, awesome. And so when I see these guys actually implement what we do, it's, it's incredible. But going back to uh, Josh, we were at this um, conference in Indianapolis and we all go to dinner and he's, he's over there just texting away on his phone, like going nuts. Like his face went from red to blue to green to, to whatever. Right. And I'm over there going, what is, what is wrong, bro? Like, what are you doing? He goes, oh God, we just got our first bad review. We just got the, uh, it was, it was a customer. No, I've heard this story. It was yeah, a customer yeah. that was all bad. And he's like, oh my Lord. And I said, bro, that's awesome. He goes, what do you mean that's awesome? I said, I said, listen, I'm going to be really clear. I said, if you have 5,000 five-star reviews, you're a fake company. 100%. You're fake. You're fake. 100%. You're fake reviews. You're a fake person. You're fake. And uh, that's like getting the, the girl on Tinder. Then when you see her, she's got the fake screenshot of her, yep. her, 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 her filtered face. Yep, and, this, yep. and you see her, and she's like, she looks nothing like her. Yeah. Well, look at when <laughs> I, I tell guys when they ask about Google reviews, and I say, when you pull up five different stores, do you – are you skeptical about the, like you said, the 5,000 five-star reviews? And they go, yeah. And I go, there yeah. you go. Yeah. Yeah. So I turned around and I said, I said, let me see. He handed me his phone. I looked at the bad review. I said, a well-written response. Every time we've gotten a bad review, I thank them. I turn around and thank the customer. Hey, thank you so much for bringing this to my attention. I was uh, unaware that we had this faulty uh, in our system. This is going to help make my company a better company. Remember the Tesla customer when yeah. we were over yep. on the on the beach? Yeah. And then you responded to her and she said, I will. It was a negative experience. You responded uh, that w- exact way you're talking. And then you showed me her response back that said, wow, I will continue. Uh, mind you started with a bad experience, was not happy. And then based on your reply, she responded, I, that I, that's why I'm going to continue to go to you. Yeah. I, listen, any, it's like cooking a bad steak. Are you never going to go back to that restaurant? You and your steaks, man. I love Every them, man. analogy it's is so good. Steak. You got to realize, but it's true. It. It's so, I, I agree. The analogies yeah. and yeah, they're and simple. Any I, service industry, yeah. especially the yeah. restaurant industry, yeah. we can apply a lot of the a same lot analogies. of the same things. So yeah. here's the thing: everybody's going to have a bad day. How did you make the bad day a good experience? I've had customers that have had a bad experience that have turned around and been my most loyalist customers. Me too. Me too. And they left bad reviews. I made a good reply. I reached out. I texted the guy. And you know what the thing is? I never gave him a refund. I fixed the problem. I went above and beyond, and I rolled out the red carpet, and I admitted it. I right. said oh, for sure. 100%. My tenor had a bad day. Yes. I'm going to have to buy him glasses. Yeah. But we're going to implement some new procedures and some checks and balances to now hopefully in the future, you brought something to my attention that now wasn't at my attention that now I think we can fix. Sure. Yeah. 100%. You know, I... um. I think you're an unbelievable guy, man. I think you have such a diversity of skill sets, and um, feelings mutual, brother. Yeah, man. You know, I'm just bigger. I know so. we got to be careful because you know how we are when we get together. Yeah, we can talk. All like, day. yeah, people would be like, okay, we can't do a five hour podcast. No, this so. this can't be five. So, with that being said, I'm leading into all these glasses up here. You know, you know, I don't know that many people that know me, but. Um, I have a bar at my house, and I have a really good whiskey collection. Wait, they don't know you? You're, you're Mike Mother F. And I know, I know, but the audience will get to learn to know me as we're on our first date with the audience now. Oh, fair so fair I need about three or four podcasts for True. these people to start to get Warm to know up, me, yeah. right? Yeah. So we're going to taste some whiskey. Um, this is one of my favorite whiskeys. We've got up here um, Whistle Pig uh, and Boss I Hog. Them. I know you love it. So we're going to start with the 15-year. They're about 250 bucks a bottle, and uh, we're going to start... With this one. 
this is a big deal because I'm a Boss Hog fan. Yeah. I always have been. Yeah. To me, and as I was, re before we started this, as I was researching some of these bottles you have, I didn't even know that the, I mean, Boss Hog is pretty baller out of the, you know, out of the gate. Right. But some of these that you have are yeah. like a whole different level. You can Google them. They're uh, they're pretty expensive. Um, they're but pretty you know what? This is the, let's taste them. Let's see. Does expensive matter? I don't like, know. Let's we'll taste see. them and see. All right, let's do All it. All right, let's taste this stuff, brother. We've got um, Whistle Pig 15 year. So the audience doesn't know, or they, the listeners, they, they I guess, it's not really know. an audience, is they, that as uh, you were the first, uh, in all the traveling and consulting I did yeah. for all the people that offered to let me stay I, at their place. I poured more for you. Uh, fair enough. Because I'm the bigger guy, right? No, you're, no you're, 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 you're. But you're, all the people that offered and for me to stay at their house, yeah. uh, and I said no, yeah. you said nope, not an option. It's, oh, you that's know, right. It's, I, I did. You you actually were coming to town to help me on a McLaren 720. It's Mansori. Uh, Mansori. Yeah. So how do you say that? Mansori. Mansori. It's a custom kit, custom car. The guy's super cool. He was a good client of mine, and I, I, I just didn't have the skill set to do it. It was a custom job. There was not many kits available for it. It was going to take two weeks time. I literally was going to have to charge $20,000 because it was going to take me probably a month to do the car. And I literally, who did I think of? Superman himself, clear bra, Chris <laughs> called him up. He's like, Hey, you know, I could probably get down here in a couple of weeks and I'm going to charge you this. And it was way too cheap. I could have, he probably could have charged double. Oh, that's nice of you. you. Yeah. You were, you were selling yourself kind of cheap, you know, as skill set. you were like the best of the best doing wholesale work. I should have just, you know, found a car for you to do every week, but you had to spread your love. That's one thing I respected mm -hmm. about you is that you traveled around and gave love to everyone. For sure. You didn't just come and, you know, you did give Hugh and, um, Scott still a little bit more love and you gave clear bra, uh, uh, Kyle, Kyle yeah, yeah. sorry, uh, Kyle in uh, Indianapolis a little bit more love. They were kind of tight, but you did branch out and I did see you here. I did see you there and you bounced around to all the best places and you made time to come to Charlotte, North Carolina. And then when you did, we became friends and, I appreciate you coming. Let's taste this stuff. 15 year uh, whistle mm. pig. Ooh, it smells good. Mm. So smooth. Wow, that is so, good. So it's so smooth. That is very good. Amazing. What do you taste in that? You taste anything? What do you taste? Like caramel? I don't know. Garlic. So I'm, I'm bad. Like I'm not that good either. Well, I, I, I love like my stuff. bourbons and my whiskeys and yeah. stuff, but, but I, can I break down the, like, no. The, no. the floral and the, I don't know. But all I know is it's smooth, yeah. meaning that it didn't bite real hard, mm. and that I could just drink it. Like all right. It. We're going to leave those there. Mm -hmm. All right. But I didn't get to finish. Go ahead, pour. No, no, no. Go ahead. No, pour. I didn't get to finish that you made me stay at your house, and I, you were like, nope, you're staying at my house. Uh, you know, And it's Southern hospitality, so I was like, oh, whatever, trying to cut costs. So uh, stay at the house. And then we had a great time. Right. But then every night, because you have, you have a bar that probably, and you know, the Danik and Mike can probably attest to this too, is, is better than 90% of most bar bars out there, your personal bar. So anyway, every night we would line up these bourbons and whiskeys and do what we're doing now. Yeah. And I was like, I can't stay at Mike's house when I work <laughs> because like he wakes up at 10 o'clock in the morning at 6 a.m. I mean, it was, you know, the, the morning is a, yeah. it was brutal. Well, you're so. eating all you can eat buffet yeah, for exactly. breakfast. You're going to work, yeah. you know, hungover. But yeah. all, right, all right. Next so one. what's, uh, what's next here? We've got the, uh, boss hog, of uh, samurai scientist. Um, yeah, this one's, this uh, one's the pricey one. Uh, well, they're, I, I don't know. They are, they're both, these are, yeah, these two are very you know, pricey. This is the, the what, king. Real, what really turned me on to these. Oh. Oops. I don't want to spill too much of it. Holy cow. That was probably yes. like, that was 150 bucks right there. Hold on. That was, that was six bucks. Yeah. All right. So, um, the, uh, these little things, check this out, man. These are really cool. A little samurai soldier. I freaking love those. These That's toppers so cool. are amazing. Like That's I'm, so cool. I'm like, I'm kind of a nerd when it comes to keeping But you know, as ornaments. we like get more into business and marketing stuff, I sit there and in my head, this yeah. is what I do. Yeah. I go, cause I, what am I enamored by? Right. This the weight that that's right right so I'm like yeah. okay I'm so is this this with this and now it's uh yeah. a thirty times more expensive yeah I mean this thing's got some weight to it oh, I mean it's a paper it's weight awesome uh, really cool it's got a little samurai on it it's uh, custom made how how many uh, are made in that in this bottle it's got for the price it's got to be pretty exclusive I don't know like I have to Google it it's um you guys want to Google that Mike 
you want to Google how many uh, samurai scientists, boss hogs they've made? Our, our, our IT department over oh, here is going for the, to. For the record, <laughs> uh, Mike he's referring to is not an assistant. He is a guest. But <laughs> yes, he is a guest. <laughs> <laughs> that sounded like the podcast assistant, right? Yeah, yeah. Like where it's yeah, like, yeah. Hey, hey, Mike, Google that real quick. Yeah, Google that. Uh, All right, so cheers. This is uh, the samurai oh, scientist. Oh, I, uh, I smell a difference already. Yeah, it smells kind of bright. A little bit more bite, a little bit lighter in the, or it's bright. Yeah, I mean, it's bright. That's why I said brighter. Bright. I can, I can it's taste like, that. Um, really smooth. Good though. So smooth. So this to me, this one has a little bit more bite, but I like the bite. Yeah. Versus this where I could probably just drink all this. This one I want to do in some swigs, but it's a lighter taste than uh, this yeah, one. Yeah. Really Super good. good though. Yeah. There's only 90 barrels in existence of that. 90 barrels. This what, is, okay, so this one or this one? I prefer this one. I do. Oh, I do prefer yeah. this one. Yeah. And how how much of those cost? Um, what's what's if you go to like a whiskey warehouse or something like that? What are they What are they asking for that bottle? I don't even know. We bought it a couple years. Ago. On the average, it's probably between fifteen hundred to twenty five hundred. Uh, this one has it as high as forty five hundred. So they're fifteen hundred bucks to four thousand dollars if you can find them. Wow. That's what I think. Wow. Which is, oh, is finding them? Yeah. Probably, yeah, it's yeah. finding them. Yeah. yeah. They're rarity. They're, it's it's rare. delicious. Yeah, it's rare. Well, because all I'm thinking is like, can we... Hey, uh, hey you're the first podcast. Yeah. You were busting open some good stuff, all right? Oh, you always do, though. Always. Mm. That's delicious. Let's save a little bit of that. Oh, God, that is so good. And we still have your old birthday party tonight. No, we have a birthday party yeah. tonight. It's going to be amazing. So that's good. Very good. I guess so... Like, delicious. That, that's It's okay. <laughs> Try this one now. I want to kind of go back... <laughs> Yeah, you can smell it right out of the. Mm. It's heavier. Like th this is this a, is a so, lighter. Oh yeah, my yeah. Lord, so good. All right, we're gonna move on to uh, the Black Prince, and Mike, my secretary. How how many did they make of this one? <laughs> <laughs> we're over here using words like. <laughs> My okay. assistant. Well, no, no. So let so uh, you, let's say you tag like bourbon tasting or something, yeah. and then somebody's watching, and you're like, "This one's super bright." <laughs> and everybody, super bright. Everybody's like, "Oh, okay." Oh, I've never this heard whiskey. So uh, check this one out. Okay. This is a um, what is this one? This is a uh, the Black Prince. It's called Fourth Edition. And, um, okay, the other guy looked like a samurai, but the Black Prince... This one's like a pig or something. Oh, they are, but this one's a pig, too. They're all pigs. That one's not. That one's just a heavy topper. We're pretty smart guys, huh? Um, these guys like, were very ooh, smart. they're pigs. So oh, they it's whistle pig. You, What's that? This one they don't give you by the barrel, but there's uh, it says a little under 6,000 bottles. 6,000 bottles in the, in the country. What's a bottle of this go for? Uh, let's take a look. So they retail... Obviously. Retail of 500. That's not its current price. Current price. Everything's going up. What yeah. is going on oh, with the world? Everything. You buy but, a bottle but, of whiskey. But, but ironically, so we're going up, not that, again, this podcast isn't diving into politics or anything no like that. No politics. But how I, I crazy is it that we just went through what's supposed to be the worst pandemic right. affecting our economy and everything, right. but yet... Everything, inflation, pricing, our cars, you know, watches. we're in the car industry, it's watches, crazy. It's, crazy. it's bananas. I, the, 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 the gap, the wealth gap that has been created because of COVID yeah. is insane. If so, you were poor, yeah. you're really poor. If you had money, you have a ton of money now. Right. So you're looking uh, roughly same as the other one where available, 2500 to 3500 a bottle. Wow, so about wow, twenty five hundred okay. bucks. Okay, so one last question, and yeah. I'm not going to say uh, yeah. secretary. Right? I mean, yeah, I no, respect he, him he, more than yeah, that. it's all good. Mike's. How many? Just uh, how many bottles in a um, in a not casket, but in a barrel? So that one they gave by the bottle. So that one is six thousand bottles. bottles. But bottles. like, like bottles. traditionally, I in think a barrel, it's two fifty or two hundred fifty bottles per I mean, barrel. Uh, like uh, you know, Google, Google uh, how like, many uh, bottles, bottles in are a in a barrel. Yeah. 200. 200. Okay. I was close. 200. Okay. Interesting. All right. Cheers. Let's, Cheers. Let's, uh, let's taste it and see how it is, brother. I'm going to say based on the smell that it doesn't bite as hard. Wow, this is amazing. This is even better than that one, I think. Ooh. 
That is that's super good. This is like amazing. So, no one twenty five hundred dollars so a bottle. Like. It, the, <laughs> but the, the bite. But interesting note that the bite on it. Can mm. you t- like on your palate when you first hit it, you go, Ooh, wow. okay, and then you swallow and it's smooth. Fine. This is so good. Like, I mean, out of all of them, this 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 one's like my favorite. I think. So I'm a science guy where like I like to know what I would love to sit down with. Uh, yeah, how they make these? How many wood chips are in this? Well, one? when when we ask like, why does this bite like this, or why is this bright in Mike Burke's words? Bright, like, yeah. And he's like, oh, it's because oh, we added this or yeah. we aged it like this. Yeah. Have you ever been to the um, Louisville, Kentucky? Been to all the bourbon. Ch- no, you did a tour on it though. I we did, it's... but it was during COVID, and we didn't get a chance to do. But more Heaven Hill, Four Roses. Um, one right. they were all really cool but it was during covid it was kind of weird so we got the chance to taste you know, i love angels envy yeah delicious i do too you know that you can put a little bit of water like a drop of water and it'll like brighten it up even more oh does it yeah oh it doesn't dilute it no it brightens yeah it? i think so or it changes the taste a little bit you know i'd say i debate like where i really enjoy mm. them i debate if i want to go down that connoisseur road if it's that important to me to like know Listen, everything no or ice. if i just i enjoy There's it like no this. ice this is real taste this is how it came out of the barrel and so all right so for this one, 15 year, you can buy on the shelf anytime you want. It's good. It's decent. It's not bad. Yeah. This one right here and this one right here. I'm, I'm going to go with the new, this one. Um, I probably will too. Let me, let me do this yeah, one. Yeah, all right. Wait. Yeah, it's so good. What taste on that one? Mm. Ah, that one's pretty good. That's pretty good, bro. Mm-hmm. I think I'm going to go with this one. Really? Okay. Do, do that one. Let me yeah, see. this one's so good. They're pretty close. A this little one's bit got a more bite than this one. This one's lighter. Yes. This one's smoother. Right. But I like this the one has bite. more bite. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I like the. Yep. And then this one is like you can tell that this one heavy. is like kind of a run yeah. of the mill. Yeah, yeah, it's still yeah. delicious, right. but unbelievable. Yeah, you can tell these are premium, which is nice, right? I mean, if we're, we're you're spending three grand on a bottle, mm-hmm. like show me if you're doing an eighty dollars steak, show me why it's better than a thirty dollars exactly. steak. Exactly. Oh my lord. So let me ask you one more question. Let's do it. When did you buy your first badass car? My first badass car was an E55 AMG. A E55. Yeah. What does that mean? E55. 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 So no, it's a, so it's a Mercedes. Mercedes Benz E55. The E is the uh, sedan, you know, middle like. Okay, that's the body style. Yeah. E, right. Yeah. And, and then 55 AMG. 55. So in Mercedes, if you go with the two numbers after the letter, it's going to be the AMG line generally, right. 63, etc. So the 55 at that time, point in time was a supercharged V8. All that happened was that we got a customer's car in that he had a clean and exhaust. He had a tune and it was an E55 that I did a satin black vinyl wrap on. And I thought it looked gorgeous. It was like 2008. And then, uh, or it was Rentec, not Cleman. Sorry. I did Cleman on mine. But, uh, as we were talking and just, you know, you create that relationship with your customer. I was like, how much did you pick this up for? And he's like, I don't know, like 30 grand. And I was like, what? And he was like, yeah, it's like 650 horsepower. And I'm like, what? Is that turbo? No, it's supercharged. Oh, supercharged. But it was still a Mercedes. Okay. And so that was like, I immediately went online and bought it and tuned it and put rims on it. And like everybody like knew that car. Like I, I back then when I, you know, went a little harder, let's say, and, and went out, I would have people be like, hey, I saw you out at so-and-so. Like the whole car knew that, yeah. the town knew that car. Um that yeah, that was that, and, and you know it's rewarding. I tell I had uh, Tyler O'Hare. You know Tyler yeah, O'Hare, yeah, uh, American rapper. Good guy. He reached amazing. out to me look, because you know he looks like Superman. I know he's a beast. I mean, he, he, no, he looks like Clark Kent. But he's also so disciplined and fixed on the in the or uh, <coughs> focused in the competitions. Yeah, he, uh, you know, me. I'm not gonna lie. I've done some competitions where if I bent over to do a lower bumper, I might have fallen over. Like, uh, you know, I, I went hard the night before. Tyler O'Hare won't even drink. He won't do. He goes to bed at eight thirty. He's, he's Clark he Kent. A, yeah, it's Clark 100%. Kent. One hundred percent. Yeah, he's got the glasses. But in. he messaged me once because he worked and competed in the competitions for another company, and then st- branched off and did his own. And he's very intense and he said how many years after you started your shop did you buy your first nice car like to to reward yourself yeah exactly and i was like oh it was about uh probably six or seven years um because i was pretty focused on growing and then i was like and i and he was like okay and i was like why what's up and he's like well i'm thinking about getting an m2 an m2 and i was like well can you afford it and he goes yeah and he goes but i don't want to feel guilty that i should have spent that money in the business and i'm like buy it and I said, are you a car guy? And he goes, 100%. And I said, buy it. Because for me, 
And so I, let me use not to take too long, but my father, he I'm the oldest of 11 kids. He was the CFO uh, of the Teamsters in Alaska. And then a big credit. I mean, always salary over 500,000 holes in his socks because he had 11 kids. Your dad? So my, yeah. He spent wow. it all on us. But huge car guy. My love of cars came from him. Okay. I mean, you know, GTO back in the day, just all these cars. But then, you know, he's 50 years old. He's driving a diesel Jetta to work. Commutes an hour and a half in it. Kids start leaving the house. We're all doing okay. And he's still making, you know, good money. And so I tell my mom, I said, because he had been sending me posts on Porsches, like 996 Turbo back in the day. And I go, mom, tell dad to buy that because he loves her and he does whatever she says. So, and she's like, what? And I was like, he needs a car. Uh, he needs to uh, enjoy something for himself for all the hard work he does right. for, you know. I think everybody should. Everybody. So she tells him, and then I talked to him about a month later after getting it, and I go, how's driving home? He goes, best part of my day. So uh, that's what I told Tyler. is like, buy it, man. Yeah. Like when I bought, like, I remember taking like a trip to Vegas and driving a Viper that we bought for track wrap because I sold track wrap to yep, Expel. Yep. But we had, we'd bought a Viper for track wrap. And I remember driving it through the canyons in Vegas after working like 28 hours straight to get work done in Alaska and going like, this is why I do this. You have to do something to you reward yourself. You know, the yourself. very first nice car I've ever bought, you burnt the wheels off of it. The GT500? I know how crazy. Nice how crazy. I'm I, 49 years old. It was like two years ago. You hadn't done a burnout. Ever in my life. I know. <clears throat> That's crazy. Never. I've and always it, worked. I drove a company van for 15 years. Right. But it, but it puts a smile on your face, man. When we get older, yeah. we don't have those smiles on our eye. At least me. You know me? what puts a smile on my face? Is right. every time I look back at the video of me and you doing that burnout. In midday. <laughs> midday in a Gold's Gym parking lot. No, it was, it was, it was Fitness Connection. Or Fitness Connection. It was, like, it was closed, though. It yeah. was COVID. So say a story. Well, no, just midday. And he's like, I've never done a burnout. And I was like you're kidding me. And he's like, no, never, never done a burnout. I was like, well, if there's ever a car to do a burnout in, it's a, uh, you know, GT 500. And I'm telling you the smoke that that thing pulled out, it was ridiculous. Oh yeah. I was we like did, a kid in a candy store. We did donuts, I felt 16. We did. But I, you know, and it I cost and me a thousand dollars that day. Just so you know, I know in tires, I had to I buy know. new tires. I loved it. <laughs> but at the same time I laughed because you know, you, we put line lock on. So mm. talk about 2021 oh, yeah. where like, oh, no, I pressed three <laughs> buttons and had a line lock. Yeah. It wasn't like the good old days. No, it was awesome, man. I had a great time. And then, and then I go, how do you do donuts? He goes, oh, give me the car. He goes out there and he just starts. So fun, though. He was awesome, man. Yeah. And then you took the car to uh, Joey Logano's. Joey place, Logano's, right? right, because Joey Logano loves to post on his YouTube videos all his cars, and he does donuts in the yeah. parking lot of yeah. Clutch. And uh, um, That's how we met this and videographer Micah, guy. Exactly. Michael, Michael, say what's up, buddy. Rockstar. What's up, man? This dude, Micah, is a beast, man. He's like, you know what? You and it's still going to take some money on that. At Micah's, some point in time. Micah, I mean, he's a, like, when he makes, a, you know, 50 he, million, I'm going to take, listen, I'm going to ask when, the, when the podcast goes national and we're, we're competing with Joe Rogan, um, Micah's going to owe you some money. You know why? <laughs> you know, the funny part is, you know what? I wanted to set you guys up. Not only is he phenomenal at what he does. Yeah. Tell, tell me, tell me the story. I got this dude. Tell me, tell you guys. Well, it. no, it's just, he was working. Uh, so he, so, uh, Micah is phenomenal at what he does. And, and everybody at Joe Lagano's facility clutch raves about uh, him. And they're pretty bummed that he didn't stay with them full time. <laughs> I was doing some cars for Joey Logano for expel as a sponsorship. And, uh, Micah did the, the video work on yeah. it. So as we were talking, Talking and got to know him a little bit better. I was like, and then you were at a phase where you were growing Sunstopper so much, yeah. and you didn't have a dedicated guy. Yeah. And then I think you and I even talked, uh, Micah, about like, hey, because I was like, oh, I know a lot of people. You know, I think your services could be used. So then I just told you, and I was like, hey, the, the guy that just filmed the Joe, filmed the Joe Logano stuff was like, let's be very a, clear though. You said farm boy. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, you straight up. You both. <laughs> So, uh, so we're really in North did. Carolina. You did. You to have, me, that's you, that's you, like you, the he South literally, Farm. Uh, Micah, I'm not kidding. He looked over at me and he goes, "Hey, man, I got to introduce you to this guy, Micah. He's super cool. He's like you. He's like a big farm boy." Yeah. <laughs> no. Well, 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 like, and so now, in all fairness, Mike has lost a little weight now, but he was like pretty beefed yeah. up back then. And and I, Mike Burke is beefed up, and so yeah. I, yeah. I was like, "Hey, this guy." I mean, has this a dude passion. looks so good. I hang out with yeah. this guy. Like everybody, everybody loves this guy. But um. But anyway, we yep. um, we're just chilling out, man. So, um, so what's your new adventure? 
you have uh, sold your company in Alaska and you now work for Expel. Yep. Elaborate a little bit on what it's like to go from being a business owner, uh, running the show, traveling around the country, doing paint protection for hire, working on the most exotic cars in the world to settling down and working for a corporation that now has different roles and tasks. I mean, tell me what you're doing. Like, what are you doing in corporate role? Like you have to send a ton of emails. I mean, you have to have reports. I mean, what, what is going on over there? You, you're, you're with a publicly traded company. You used to work for yourself, making as much money as you wanted to make. And now you're held accountable. So tell me a day to day, like, tell me what are you doing? So uh, day to day, you're right. I mean, I, it's a, uh, it's amazing. I've joked around about zoom meetings and having those for 10 hours straight mm. and how I'm more tired or I feel more exhausted right. doing that uh, than 12 hours of installing. But, you know, as we look at, so on, on the Expel side is we, we love creating partnerships. We love uh, looking at acquisitions. But a big part of that is looking at the owner of that acquisition and saying, can they fit in a corporate role? Right. And a corporate role means guess what? You have somebody that you report to, right? You're not an owner. Yeah, exactly. And that's a big part for me where I've but had, you were a consultant first, right? Right. I was a consultant. And, and to be honest, for quite a few years, when people would approach me, like, come work with us, come do this, come do that. I was like, no, I, I haven't had a boss in 20 years. Like I do what I want right now. And I make very good money. Um, but as I've gone older and can't keep up the same pace that I used to, and, and I have worked in a corporate structure, uh, the right, uh, you know, proposition from Expel came across to where like now where I oversee uh, our automotive film side and, and products, and then I'm also involved in our corporate stores, and then I do testing and R&D, all very interesting things to me that I love. Um, it, it finally, after the, the right pitch, uh, made sense for me, and I came from that. Like I, I was in a corporate world of, with engineering, so it was an easy transition. Right. But there's some people that look and say, hey, Chris, I want to do what you did. I've, I've owned a shop for 25 years. I'm older. I want to do that. And I'm like, well, I don't know if you are. Can you check in at 8 a.m. every day and then you go home at 5 p.m.? Like, can you have somebody tell you? I don't like what you did. Right, right. And, and that's a big part. So maybe a consultant role is better. And that's still a valid option. Sure. Um, but it's, it is very corporate -y. Like I, I dress different and I, I have meetings to go to and I have a, uh, are agenda you, are you, to, let me ask you a question. Yeah. Like, <clears throat> I know this is just far fetched, but it's something I thought about. Do you consider yourself a sellout? Um, no. Okay. No, I don't because Here's the thing, and I've said this at, where I've done a bunch of business ventures over over the years. I think every business, is, and I, I compare it to a roller coaster, it has peaks and valleys. Uh, I don't think that every business, and if you look at the stock market, you can just watch the historical data on companies are always a, a ascending trajectory. Sure, it's this. Right. Oh yeah, up and down, up and down, right. roller coaster. So, and I've met uh, mentors that. All they do is buy, create, build, and sell businesses. And that, and that, once I started thinking more about that, because I'm like, well, why would you, are you a sellout? Why would you want to sell your business? You're making money. But that's part of the business model that that person does right. is creating a, a value, making money off that value. So in our service-related business, it's a, a, I know guys in this industry that have top shops that have been doing it for 25 years. And don't have an exit strategy. Oh, yeah. What do you do when you're 50 years old? They buy Bitcoin. Right. Well, Bitcoin. Yeah. Right. That's all they do. They well, buy but, but, what, but what are you going right. to do? Right, Dan, isn't that what you said? Buy Bitcoin? Buy Bitcoin. Yeah. He, but, but, what, but what's your exit strategy? Buy how Bitcoin. Re, how reliant <laughs> how, <laughs> how, how relying is that business on you? How much, uh, what's the future? Are you adapting? A big thing that I say that a lot of older guys in our industry do is that they go, uh, they continue to run their business based on the metrics in their 45, 50 year old mind. You know what happens? My favorite thing is to get a young guy. A young guy has a totally different outlook need, on how to grow here, that business. Here's the thing, man. I don't have Snapchat. I don't have TikTok. Well, that's for the ladies. I mean, you got to be careful. So but listen, if I had Snapchat and TikTok, I'm available, but no, just See, kidding. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> so here's the thing. You get to hire a guy in your business that has a creative brain who's ambitious and driven. And most 
business owners across the country are intimidated by the ambition that that's got. I want to fuel that ambition. And one thing that I always say is, do you have an installer mindset or do you have an in investor mindset? mindset because or business are you like an well, owner I, I get yeah. I get that but what I'm what I'm trying to tell oh, investor meaning making money okay so yeah. here's the thing if you were to buy a stock yep are you emotionally attached to that stock well you shouldn't be no but you usually are no but you or buy, some guys so, are so you buy Apple so, right. okay you're gonna pay 10 grand you put Apple stock and stock goes up goes down what goes up goes right. down but eventually you just want to make money off the future investment right. right right if you're gonna make money the rule of thumb is to not be emotionally right invested, you just right. want to make some money off right. of it so here's the thing one thing that I did with Sunstoppers is I look at each individual that comes into my life as an investment. Right. I've always said if you invest in people, you're going to get a higher rate of return than you will in the market. Right. But let me qualify because I've heard you say this before sure. because we, we do a lot of yeah, consulting sure, together sure. is that I want to make sure that anybody that listens to this, when Mike Burke says, Mike Mother Effin Burke says uh, that's that I look at an employee as an investment. Don't take that the wrong way because some people might look at that as like, I'm a commodity. Right, I, I, right. When Mike Burke says that, he means a mutual investment. Sure. Meaning that, that it's money for you and it's money for me. Because I'm just going to say sure. that when I've heard you say yeah, that, yeah. I could see somebody going like, oh, okay. Well, I'm just a, a commodity right, right, making money off right. me. No, it's mutual. Right. If, if Mike Burke makes money, you make money. But the thing is, if you take a guy that's making, say, 800 bucks a week. Delivering pizzas. He meets you. So he meets you. Right. Clear bra crust. You right. te teach him how to do clear bra. Right. Like six, eight weeks. Take him I can tent, by the way. But yeah, okay. Okay. I've seen you tent. You're okay. pretty good. Um, he is still pretty good at it. But, um, you know, could he do production tenting? No. Ah. Oh, that's the whiskey talking. Okay. He's, he's quality. He's quality. He's that guy that'll spend three hours on a car. It's okay. He's good. Okay. I, I'm 45 minutes and I'm okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the girl liked it and it was 45 minutes. He was three hours. And you made a ton of money. I get it. It's, I get I'm, it. I've got two in by the time you did one. Fair enough. Fair it's enough. okay. Fair Sorry. enough. I, I, you see my glasses are empty and yours aren't. But Fair it's enough. Okay. <laughs> no, but listen, realistically, if you tell an employee from day one, I'm going to make money off of you. Is that is that a fair statement to say? Uh, fair, yeah. Is it? I mean, but here's the thing. If I look at you, Claire Brock Chris, and I say, hey, you're going to work for me at Sunstoppers, I'm say, hey, man, you're going to make money, but I'm going to make money. Is that okay? Is, do people think that, that it's not okay to make money off their employees? No, it's mutual. That's yeah, what I say. No, right. it's okay. Yeah. But some people get butt hurt. They're like, oh, this dude's making all this money. Look at the car he's driving. And right. you know, he's living a lifestyle I can't afford, blah, blah, blah. Do you help these people grow or do they just stay in that role forever? No, I 100% agree because employees do think that and installers. And you know mm -hmm. what I love to do? I love to break down. Right. And I've sat down with guys before right. and said, this is everything that I do. Right. And I said, I can do what you do. Right. So if you want to take a month and we'll trade. Right. I'll go tint your car. I'll yeah. knock it out in three hours. Yeah. Mike Burke will do it in 45 minutes, but I'll tint your car. But you're going to do, you're going to bring the customer in. You're going to deal with the guy that had the paint pulled. Sure. You're going to do the accounting. You're, you're going to pay the, the taxes. Problems. You're going to do all yeah. this. I'll do yeah. this. Yes. Yeah. And then, and I, and 99.999% of the time they go, I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. They I'll don't go, want the responsibility. No, I'll go to they the want the money, but they don't want the responsibility. Right, and that's why it's mutual. And and I tell everybody. So a lot of uh, installers don't like their managers, uh, not the owner, but the owner hires the manager. Right, because the manager's an asshole. Here's like the thing. Problems. Let me ask you a question. You can tent. You can do clear bra. You can do customizing. Do you think it's easier for you to grow and hire employees that you can they respect you more because you can actually do every part of the business and they know that? Sure, one hundred percent. I think that's the group. That's the thing. Yeah. My employees, they know when I come to the shop that I can put on an apron and I do a lot of times I'll put on an apron and I'll be the first person to jump into the most hardest thing. I'm the guy that says, Oh, you want to jump off this building into a pool that's five foot deep and you want to see if you survive. I'm the first one jumping. True. Like, but I'm, I'm going to counter that though, is that, excuse me, the, um, they respect the Slow man down over there. We got a party. They, These they, dudes are over here drinking seltzer. Well, they're like waiting for they're like waiting water. for their turn. Yeah, I know. Because we can talk for ten hours. But let me let me go, go to that real quick because the installer will respect. Like I'm very respected because I will show and do any job that they're doing. Sure, vinyl wraps, tan, yeah. whatever. Um, so, but the thing is, is that if 
a lot of times an owner that knows all those services that well, uh, he uh, handicaps the growth yes. because he steps in. 100%. Whereas a true manager that maybe doesn't know those services is focused on the metrics of growing the business. Yeah. So what happens is as an owner, you have to figure out the balance of like, is your employees, is it okay that they don't respect the manager that much because he doesn't know how to do it? And, but he's growing the business because as an owner, you're looking at profits. So it's a, it's a fine balance. And you know what I tell managers that don't know how to do it because they're like, I need to go get trained. I need to know how to do it. I go, no, you don't have to. As an owner, I want you because you're looking at the, the, the metrics and the, 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 um, the numbers. Right. But you know how you gain your respect? Go fill up his bottles. Yeah. Go empty the trash. Yeah, no shit. Go, go pull out the car. Right. When he finishes the car and then you're pushing him to jump on the next car, go, go say- wipe it down. Yes. Go wipe go it say, down. Go say, hey, Get wipe it down. Get some wipe it and, down. And it's like, yeah. I, I've been at a shop before. Do you and think I'm not managers gonna say, think that they're too good to do the job? 100%. And, and it's crazy because as an owner, I've- Empty trashes. I've done. I clean the bathroom as soon as I walk in the door. One thousand percent. And 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 I hate it. I was at a shop, and I'm not going to name what shop, where I was working for them. As a, I charged a ton of money for uh, this car. So I finished the car. The dealership's already waiting to pick it up, a Ferrari, and he's been waiting for an hour. So the manager walks out and says, "Hey," because I said, "Hey, we just need to do a quick wipe down, make sure it's good." So the manager walks out. And says, hey, everybody, stop what you're working on. Come help Chris wipe down the car uh, so we can get it out of here because the guy's been waiting. And then he no shit went like this. Didn't do a thing. Just fucking. He, he should have stopped what he was doing. And, 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 and folded his arms and watched. And I'm like, you can't grab a microfiber you towel and me? help us? Really? Bananas. That's so stupid. I, 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 I don't respect that. So, I don't either. Yeah. yeah. Um. You're amazing. We could talk for freaking know, 10 hours, bro. I love you. Here's the thing, man. We've got some other guys in the studio right now. Mike and Danik from Eurotech are here. They came in from our birthday. Rock stars. These dudes are amazing. They're, they're fucking, they, listen, the reason they don't have notoriety in this industry is because they don't have time to be on chat rooms, Facebook forums, and all that. And that's one thing that I really want to, you know, hit on a, down. Oh the yeah. Road. Ask them about it. I love that. It's hear amazing. That. These yeah. dudes are so busy working and making money. Real business owners are so focused when they wake up in the morning that they're so focused on work. But you know what I respect about them is that they kill it and are doing great and they still enjoy it because I used to say that if I was enjoying it, I wasn't effectively being a good business guy and they, they do it. They do them both. they, if you look at their Facebook and their Instagram, mainly you guys use Instagram, right? Right? Yeah. Mainly their Instagram. Yeah. The cars that they work on, they have $10 million worth of cars in their shop. Right, but at the same million. time, they still out really? and they, they go out on the weekend. I'm working and on they, Kias and Camrys. But they enjoy the boat ride, right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, that's that's the key. Well, let's get him on. Let's get him on. Danik, what's up, buddy? Let's welcome Danik from Eurotech, man. I want to say thanks for these guys flying to North Carolina, Charlotte. And all I can tell you is that, how do you like Charlotte? It's actually amazing. You like it? Yeah, it's very clean, a lot different than you know we're used to. So where the hell are you from? Um, we're from basically 30 minutes outside of New York City. Where the so, hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> so North, North Jersey. Hold on. Um, my, my, my IT department's yeah, telling me you got to speak into the podcast. You got you to like, so. speak into this thing. Like, you know, make it a seltzer. Like, like kiss it. No, just make it. it a seltzer. All right, you got it. Um, so we're basically the tri-state area, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. We kind of touch, you know, everything in Bergen County, um, anything before the New York state border. Cool. You're um, a certified mechanic. So I started, um, to give you a little background Come to the microphone, but I started back, uh, when I was a teenager. Okay. Teenager. Um, 12. We, yeah. I was doing, uh, after high school, I was getting dropped off at a body shop. Okay. Um, in high school. Yep. I loved cars, loved motors. Um, when I was real young, started with dirt bikes, motorcycles, stuff like oh, that. There you Just go. That, that's my world. I love that. Quads. Love you know, it. A lot of redneck stuff. Love it. <laughs> you, you're a Southern boy at heart. Yeah. I, I love motors, you know, anything that went fast, stuff like that. Cool. 
Um, I found a niche working on cars and, and kind of... Uh, and you were how old? Um, at that time, I was a uh, freshman, sophomore, so 14, 15. Oh, wow. Working at a body shop. Yeah. Um, you know, learning under the manager and kind of doing mechanical So what did you do work. there? Um, I honestly started sweeping the floor, doing body work. Just like I want to um, be around cars. Kind of just like a labor. Yeah. It's like me um, working at a strip club. <laughs> I, mean, I just want to be around women man that's, that's sorry that's it, that's i'll, I'll clean the bathroom i'll massage your feet whatever <laughs> i i really just love cars and uh you know I, i've spent time and you know a lot of people ask me about that those days and uh i remember a few things and and it definitely was one of the uh most important things i never really put time into uh things worrying about the money at the end of the day. Right. I wanted to learn about what I was doing, if there was a future. Um, I remember a conversation I had with the manager asking him, you know, how much can I make here in the future? If I get to be the best person in this business, right. best painter, best body, whatever, what, what is the max I can make? Right. And he told me, and I was like, well, this isn't for me. Wow. You know, what did he I, tell you? What was that number? It, it, it was over a hundred, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't my future. I worked there. Uh, it was June. I graduated June. I worked there till the following May. Okay. And what'd you do um, after so that? So it was almost a year. Um, I actually started working at an Audi dealership as a tech. Yeah. I and also, um, grew up with one of the, the lead techs there, um, who eventually became my business partner. And he basically just mentored me through everything. And what I mean, was his name? His name was Ryan. Ryan, okay. Um, so he mentored you at this Audi dealership. Yeah. Did you get certifications? Did you go to school? Fully certified. Did you go to schooling? School? Yeah. Okay. So you went to a. They school? would send you to, uh, you know, Audi Technical School. How long did that take? Um, they were all. It, you basically go for um, branches of the program. Like you go for a week, you go for two weeks. Okay. You know, they had them in in South so Jersey, Boston. You know, we were flying all over to. How, to how get many? How many times a year? Um, several times a year. Okay. So you yeah. were constantly getting certified. Yeah. Anything, any new product, um, you know, RA training, anything electrical, any, any updates. How long did you work at Audi? Um, about eight years. Eight years. And then mm -hmm. all of a sudden you and Ryan said, let's go freaking do this shit on our own. Um, we saw a need for better, better service, quality customer service. Right. Um, started building a little clientele on the side that, you know, people were doing stuff that the dealership wouldn't. Um, and our, our main focus was never about money being successful. It was really just making somebody happy. Sure. Our, our customer base. You're generally a nice guy. I wanted to help people out. Yeah. And, and, you know, it, it, people just don't understand that aspect of anything. Like if you provide a good service, if you, uh, make somebody happy, they're going to go out to dinner and tell five people at the table. Sure. If somebody, you know, goes out and thinks, you know, I want to start a business, I want to make money. It's just the wrong idea. Right. Like you right. have to know what you're doing, do sure. it well, provide a good service. Cut, you know, it, it comes in the end. Like everybody wants to jump to just being a billionaire. Oh yeah, you like got 18 year old kids now. There's just steps to they, where you have to really focus on the core of what gets you to that level. Monday, Monday through Friday, we we crush it. You know, I, I work a lot. I try to limit it. I'm up early in the morning. So but, when did you start your business, Eurotech? We started in 2010. 2010. Mm -hmm. In and a little uh, two-bay shop. In a little um, two-bay shop, and you were doing just service, like oil changes, mechanics, brake work, or stuff like that? Yeah, so we started with mechanical work. Um, that was right after, you know, the big recession. Yep, crash. Or nine, yep. Um, a lot of people kept cars longer. When we started, we were doing a little performance work, which is kind of what built our higher clientele in the beginning. Um, but the biggest thing that I realized a year or two into it, um, which we didn't really make any money, you know, the first year we were focusing on just throwing it back into the business, getting it going. Um, I, I saw a need for diversity in the business. You know, if maintenance gets slow, you have performance. If performance gets slow, you have aesthetic stuff, clear bra, window tinting. So when you say detailing. performance, what do you mean? We were doing exhaust. We okay. were doing uh, intercoolers, turbo sure. swaps. I mean, wow. a lot of the earlier Audi models were were very tunable. Big, big, big clientele for that. And the shop we have now is uh, fourteen thousand feet. Four, did you hear that, guys? Fourteen thousand square feet. Like that is freak. Very diverse. Clearbrow Chris has never seen fourteen thousand square feet. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's God. bigger in New York, baby. You know how you know how they do it in New York, baby. Alaska don't have fourteen thousand square feet building. They got like four thousand square feet building. Well, how big was your building? Uh, we have ten thousand. No way, your building was ten thousand. Come on, was a little it like, bit of everything? What'd you do? Take over an old Costco or something? <laughs> but that was twenty years. That was twenty years. How, um, how did I meet you, man? So we had a, a sales rep prior to the newest sales rep for Expel. And, uh, you know, they had dealer conference, but it was never like a big thing. You got to go meet people. It was always like, yeah, it's a dealer conference, right. whatever. And, you know, I, I don't really like taking time off unless I'm doing something fun. It wasn't really brought to me as something fun. So we didn't go. Finally got a new sales rep. It's like, you have to go. Your numbers are, you know, the highest in New Jersey, this and that. So we ended up, I, I ended up going, um, and, uh, you know, met a ton of cool people, tons of new ideas, kind of lit a fire under me to kind of branch off to different things. And um, I couldn't wait to get home and tell everybody about it. But you know, we went out for the last dinner and uh, I was sitting at a round table, you know, in a private room. And um, so how many people were, comes how, in how, how, and, how many people were in this room? Like it was a private <laughs> dinner, right? It was probably like 30. At but the it was top. like the who's who. The top he, people. The Our top, table was kind of like yeah. the, the biggest dealers. But in, you were in the there. Country. You were the top dealer. Like you're the yeah, badass. Yeah, I'm more quiet at the dinner table. And, and, you know, this guy just comes in yelling and who, eating. Chris Hardy? <laughs> 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 eating, literally eating calamari off my plate, tasting a little bit of everything from yeah. everybody's plate. <laughs> and uh, it ended up being Mike Burke. Yeah. So. No, no, no. no. Hold, as, Chris, as Chris West would say, yeah, it's Mike. We, we, yeah. It's Mike F. But there's Burke. no vulgar allowed. So yeah, exactly. It's it Mike nice F. Way. Yeah, it's okay. So you met me. I was crazy, loud, obnoxious. Yeah, we I just walk started in. talking. You hated me from uh, day one. You were like, this dude's an idiot. I didn't hate. I just thought you were absolutely out of control. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what happened is the energy transfer, like from all these big dealers, um, you know, people don't realize when you go there, you're like, you already know a little bit about everybody right. without them knowing. So yeah. when you meet these people, you're like, and, and Chris West was one of them. You know, you hear about oh. Chris West for oh, two yeah. years. I know he's a legend. Like he's crazy. The like, best, just the fastest, I want his, the, you know, the I want teacher. his signature. I want his autograph. And, uh, you know, then when you finally meet him, he's like, oh, this guy, I don't even, you know, like, he's it's from just Alaska. A, it's a very weird meeting. But I'm, it yeah. just, it, it literally pumps the energy for everybody. And that's what happened that, that weekend. It was yeah. like, we all got on planes writing business plans and calling everybody and like, we're going to just explode this. I know mess, it's crazy, you know? man. I, I, I love Chris Hardy for pulling all of us together. He did. He, he, he was, he, we he owe was him. the fire. We you do. Know? We owe, he, he fired he us up. everybody to go. And you know, here's the thing, man. I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm in tent and windows for 30 years. Lightning, I Mike. Lightning, Mike. Lightning Mike, baby. And I didn't think there was anybody out there in the world like me. Like I go out there and meet people for the first time that actually are smart, actually run a successful business I grew up in, a, in an environment where everyone was just, you know, I was put down, man. I was, I was put down. Like I, I was an oil change mechanic to all my friends. You know, I have a college degree, you know, my dad, you know, wasn't really proud of the fact that I was tinning windows and, um, you know, I'm sure he's, he's absolutely proud of me today, of, of course, course, but, yeah. but it's kind of one of those situations where it's like, I lost a lot of friends. Yeah. How many friends did you lose doing this? you you kind of have to pick and choose, you know, who's going to go to the end with you. I mean, you, people will start seeing you become successful and not want to be around you. People, you know, don't have time for you because, you know, you're you're just a mechanic and you kind of weed out what right. keeps going with you. Tell people the kind of cars you work on every day. So we uh, we honestly have a very wide variety of uh, clients. I mean, you work I mean, on every work time on I look on Instagram, you have Ferraris in there all the time. We do a lot of high end work. Um, we cater to a little bit of everything with performance, um, detailing, ceramic coating, Expel. Yeah, but like, what's the nicest car you've ever worked on? Um, probably some of the Lamborghinis, Ferraris, SVJs. Um, yeah, SVJs. What's like some the, of the nicest Ferraris. car? Like the nicest, nicest. Like if you pick one car, Bugatti, Pagani's. What, what, what's the most expensive car that's been in the shop? Probably the the SVJ Roadsters right now. What are they? Um, Nine hundred grand? Yeah, around a million right now. Yeah, they're you know there's a lot listed, um, but we've had some rare cars too. I mean, it's all it's all different. I mean, we don't really um, you know there's shops out there that 
only cater to the high end stuff, but we right. we're so diverse that right. we do basic maintenance, which I love. We do, you know, detailing work, expel a lot of expel. Let me ask you a wheels, question. Tires, everything. You work on a lot of nice cars. What do these guys do, man? Like, who is the most famous? Do you have any names? Like, you name drop somebody? No name drop. You got to name bro. drop we have some somebody. Super successful Come on, clients. bro. We got to know somebody. Like, you worked We've on J Lo. Have you worked on J Lo's car, guys? Just so you know, this guy works on famous cars every single day. <laughs> like every, like you, all the people that live in New York City. Oh, uh, yeah. So, so, <laughs> well, listen, so Clip Rock Chris is over here going, yeah. yeah, I did this guy's car, this guy's car, this guy's car. Donic won't say fucking thing. <laughs> See, this is what happens when you're from New York. You're a made guy. You're, you're in the mafia <laughs> and you know, you're in the mafia of the car club community and you sign NDAs to sign up, like drop off their car. You're like, nobody knows this is my car, right? <laughs> Do you sign yeah. an NDA? Like people do, do they ask you to do that shit? We try to keep things quiet just out of respect. Out of respect? Yeah. I mean, well, listen, the biggest thing with, with all of it is uh, you kind of read your clientele. You right. kind of get to know them. Um, some guys are flashy. You know, with building a good business and having people that trust you. Right. I mean, we, we started with nothing, and our numbers kept doubling, you know, for the past 12 years. Um, my business partner that I started it with, unfortunately passed away yeah it's a man it's a sad thing i was with you yeah. the day it happened man mm -hmm. i was like it was incredible yeah we, he um, was an amazing guy he um he taught a lot of people he was a lot like everything. me yeah he, he was, was a lot like me he was a country boy he was a country boy he was um, he loved life he shoot loved, guns ride four wheelers life. absolutely yeah. would do anything he mentored you still get emails from people that he pulled over the side of the road and helped and yeah you no know, there's a, a lot of a lot of good stuff he did which you know people will always remember that right um, but you got to remember the good stuff. Yeah, we we turned over the business, you know, so many years of just multiplying our clientele and and uh, different services that we kept growing off of. And Let a lot of ask... people think they can get rich quick. And, you know, you really need a you really need to understand what you're doing and, and have a love for what you're doing and obviously know what people want before you just get rich overnight. Like there's so much that goes into a business and, you know. <laughs> But anyway, so these guys flew down here for my birthday. We're going to go celebrate at my bar. This is our first podcast. I just want to say thank you for coming, bro. I love you. Thank you for having you us. You know I bro. love you, right? Yeah, we, we all love each other, man. It's such family, man. It is. We all battle it's the same great, things. Yeah. We, we do. do. We do. We all go through the same things, and um, everything is crazy. You know, Clear Brock Chris, he, he's turned out to be one of my best friends, and so have you, and I really appreciate you in my life, man. I yeah. Do. It's been an awesome couple years. And hey, look, here's the thing. I know you don't like whiskey, but <clears throat> unfortunately, Clear Brock Chris um, said that this is like the best whiskey he's ever tasted. So you, I mean, you, I like whiskey. We'll, there we go. we'll sample. Oh, and, it's, it. and this is birthday. This is my birthday. And it's expensive. I'm 49 so it's gotta, it's years old. Taste good, right? What is this? Twenty five hundred dollars. Hey, twenty two thousand dollars a bottle. Who cares? Twenty five hundred bucks. I mean, you got a problem on your hands. Yeah. Hey, Cheers, my boy. Bro. Happy birthday. Hey, just so you know, this is a Sunstoppers uh, mm. glass, right? Just so you know. Always uh, marketing. Available for $29.99 on Amazon. With a full PPF, they'll yeah. throw it in for free. Yeah. yeah. I like it. Isn't it cool? I like it. Yeah. Yeah. And tell me about your business partner. Uh, so Mike and I actually... Uh, Who's Mike? Mike who? So Mike Flory. We, how do you uh, say that? Do you together. say that in English? <laughs> 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 we, uh, we met as teenagers, actually. It's really? kind of a funny story. My best friend lived to lived on the same street as one of his friends and I would always come through with my loud cars and you know it, it's kind of a joke now but Mike would always run out and watch me pass and you know I always had a fast loud car so yeah, long it. story short um, Mike was always super successful with anything he did he would find ways to you know start a small sell business shoes. sell shoes sell bikes sell w whatever it was hustler. I mean just he didn't even know what he was just selling. a hustler he was selling everything yeah himself um so we, uh, through our 20s, we became closer. Um, you know, he would come by the shop a lot. He was super successful in the business he worked at prior um, to coming on board with me. We kind of had a deal um, to where if he came to Eurotech and worked for me, we also were going to divide the services and open up another company that we were 50-50 on. Okay. Um, which was a mobile company. We okay. Kind of Catered to dealerships, detailing, expel. Um, Just for the dealership side. Yeah, window tint. So anything my, mobile that was out of the out facility, of the store. Yeah, out, we, we basically had a company to do. And, and he manages that. 
Yeah, he he runs it in full. I mean, right. to tell you the truth, I don't know a lot about it. Right. Um, you just know the money goes in the bank account. You know, a, a separate a bank. Page, <laughs> uh, a wire hits my account every week, and he's doing what he needs to do. So I mean, he's invited to the Christmas no, we, party. We we did a, a lot of mobile work earlier on um, when I started. You know, really getting involved in Expel, um, and I kind of turned it all down. I stopped doing all dealership work. Not only because we were super busy at the store, but we also had to wait to get paid, and it was always chasing. And I, I turned it down for years. So when he came on board, we um, we really focused on getting that for another company with new employees, um, you know, a whole different business model than what we have at the store, and it's been working out great. And we started that in uh, I think 2018, right? Yeah, it's been about four. It's, it's four been about years four now. years since we started four years. that branch, and awesome. We, we have like forty employees with that company. Um, what forty? Yeah. No shit. We I didn't realize it was that big either. And, no, uh, that's crazy. That's awesome. Mike how, runs a, so. How a many dealerships do you have? Probably four or five. Which, wow. That's and then amazing. we have we have dealers that um, we have dealerships that also just give us certain things. So. That's awesome. Yeah, it, you, it's really cool. So anyway, how'd you like the whiskey? You drinking it? Yeah, it's excellent. Man. Is it good? It, it really is. I mean, it burns every organ in my body. But <laughs> <laughs> hey, I definitely love. So, it, you know? so here's the thing. We're gonna we're gonna invite Mike. Uh, how do you say his name? Polari. Yeah. Polari. You're you're good with names. Bro. Sounds like a pizza. We both basically. <laughs> fed, we both basically. I'm going to Pol- out of school, but I think you can pronounce Polari's it right. pizza. I love it. <laughs> I, we're gonna have we're we're gonna have sushi later tonight. Perfect. I love it. Let's welcome too. Mike. I swear about that. I am, bro. I am. How you doing, brother? What's up, bro? My brother. Look at that dude right here. Let's get him on the air. Oh, Let's get him on the air. We got Mike Polari. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Bro. What's up, Happy man? Happy birthday. Thank you, man. Forty nine years old. I'm at a podcast with Clear Bra Chris from Alaska. I got Danik, uh, la, la, la whatever, Faskowski. I don't know. How, how do you say that shit? Lebowski. Uh, Lebowski, yeah. Laskowski. Laskowski, yeah. Laskowski. He's from New Jersey. And you're, you're from New Jersey too, huh? You grew up in the same neighborhood? Same town. Wow. Donald and I grew up in the same really? town. He had loud, fast cars, and you'd come out and, like, cheer him on, huh? I mean, what a lot of people don't know is, so, you know, I'm 32, Donick's 35, so when we were in high school, there was, there was a a gap he, between gap, us. Yeah. We, we, we've been friends for forever, right. but um, his best friend lived up the street from one of my good friends, and he used to come down. He, you know, his friend would come down there Ford Lightning, and yeah. he had a Stage Three uh, Audi S4 at the time, which was just that, burning. That was the hot car to have. Is that a turbo I mean, car? Yeah, twin yeah, turbo. Yeah, that's what I thought. It was a turbo car. And uh, so you, you hear know, just so when he blowing was, out. What is that called when it blows out the thing? The blow off valve. Is that what it is? Blow, yeah. yeah. The, right. Yep. That's awesome. I love that. And uh, you know, so when he started driving, he was 17 years old. I was 13, 14 years old. So to me, it was like he was your hero. Uh, I, I just, <laughs> you know, Danny. Do you know he was? He thinks you're his hero. Oh, that's crazy. No, you know, it, it's funny because I would come out and, you know, I'd see him driving by and I, I knew of him. He knew of me. We, you know, we would talk here and there. And, uh, you know, one one day he actually took me for a ride in it. And I was like, man, this is the fucking uh, badass. It's all right. I'm like, this, this is a badass. We're bad trying to go to YouTube, so we're trying to yeah, keep the we, F, F word down. We got to keep the cursing out. A little bit. Sorry. Right. Mike like, has got it. He's bleep, yeah. bleep, bleep, bleep. And got it. We we got the best. It's all good. on the market. Yeah, we right got now. this dude's amazing. So but, you uh, so you rode in his car fast, going down the road. He yeah. scared the crap out of you. Yeah, yeah. You but had I was a like, dump, I, you had I, a dump in his front seat. I was like, I need. <laughs> I, I, when, when I drive, I need one of these. Funny story. Um, when I got out of high school, um, you know, as soon as I got my license, I I was delivering pizza. I was just you were the pizza delivery. I guy. was the pizza I delivery guy. Bro. Which one? Tell me which one. No, it was, it was local pizzerias in Mawa. Oh, I, wow. I worked for a bunch of them. I mean, this was back when. You know, you can't put. Why the, are all the hustlers pizza delivery guys, bro? Because back then you, you had know, to hustle to, to make 200, 250 bucks a night cash was, it was insane back then. Oh, that's awesome. You know, and and I got to drive around and uh, and know, make money and make money off that's of it. Awesome. It, was, it was a good time, but you know, um, I was delivering pizza, and that that's kind of how I got started, and it, and it helped me save, and um, you know, I went to college thinking I wanted to go into finance and accounting and stuff. And I was in college for three and a half years. I dropped out after three and a half years. You almost uh, made it. Yeah, I could have finished. But so where'd I, you go from there? I got a call um, three and a half years into school. It was from 
a BMW dealer in the area that I had applied to probably like two years prior, you know, just to be a valet, you know, get my foot in the door, work while I was in school. And what's funny is I, I didn't know what position I was going for because I had applied so long ago. And they called me maybe a year, year and a half down the road. And uh, so I was like, I mean, I got, I got to look sharp when I show up. This is, this is my first real interview. I've been delivering pizza and, and been in college. Like, this is, you know, this is it's a big thing deal. for me. Yeah, it's a big deal. I didn't know I was going to be a valet driver. I had no idea. So I showed up and, uh, you know, nice suit, clean shave, tie. And when I when I was interviewing with the guy, he, he goes, you know, this is the first time anybody's ever showed up to a, to an interview for a valet position. Looking this, <laughs> look, looking like this. And he, and he was uh, he was a real talent guy. I'll never forget this because this is where my life twisted. Um, he was like, I, I, you know, we interviewed for probably 20 minutes, shot the shit, got along great. Um, he was like, you know what, I'm, I'm going out on a whim here. He's like, but I see something better for you than than a valet. He's like, come back tomorrow. He's like, I got to process this overnight, and I'm going to think of something I can do with you. So like, all right. I was like, this works for me. Sounds good. I go home. Got to get a new suit ready now. Oh, now, yeah, now yeah, you again, wore that one. You gotta, yeah, yeah, I wore that one. You, yeah. You know, uh, it's I'm, like a girl uh, with a dress. You got to uh, go get another one. I'm 19 years old, and 19. Uh, I'm like, all right, got to shave again, men's, new tie. Men's gotta, warehouse? Uh, back then, yeah, it was whatever I can get. <laughs> Kohl's, you know, whatever it took. And uh, so I go back the next day, and he's like, I'm going out on a whim here. He's like, I want to make you a service writer. I had no idea what this position was. I was like, that sounds great. I'm in. I'm when in. do I start? When do you start? He's like, it's a full-time job. This, 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 and that. You know, you start at 7. You'll be, you know, you're out here at 6. I'm like, holy shit. Like, that's a long day. But, I mean, if that's what I got to do, it's what I got to do. And uh, he was like, I'm going to have you training with somebody. And uh, he's like, I'm just telling you right now, I can tell by your personality. I can tell by everything. This guy actually changed my life. Um, he was like, he's like, you're going to do really well with this. So I didn't know what the pay was at the time. I was young, 19 years old. He was like starting salaries at 60000 plus commission. So back then I'm like, $60,000? i am like, that's, that's crazy. So like, I thought I was going to make that when I graduated college, let alone just in the middle of it. So I had to make a choice at that point. Do I want to finish school and, and go into the finance world, or do I want to go into cars, which is what I enjoy? And uh, like I said, I was three and a half years into college. I, I had a half a year left. I had one semester left to finish, and I threw in the towel. I said, I got to take this you risk. You said, I love cars. I said, I love cars, and, and I got to take this risk now. I can always go back and finish if yeah. I have to. So let me ask you a question. When you got your first commission check, what did you think? It, it, it was... It was an experience that. How big uh, was it? A couple grand. My first commission check, yeah, it was like twenty five hundred bucks. Did that just like mind boggle you? I, I, I never expected that at that young of an age. To, You're making eighty grand a year, probably first year. Yeah. Yeah. So it was. Uh, I did one year as uh, as a junior writer, which was you know him basically training, and I was I was shadowing people, and I was helping all the other writers, and uh, eight months, eight nine months down the road, he was like. He, old school Italian guy, really cool. He's like, bro, you're ready. He's like, I'm going to make you a regular writer. He's like, customers love you. You're very attentive. Every Like, no one has ever complained about you. I mean, look at your hair. <laughs> <laughs> you I mean, do, you have, do you have a full-time guy, what, two or three times a week that cuts your hair? No, not that often. How often do you get your hair cut? I, I go once a week. There's I don't know if you can too. zoom in on this, but this guy's hair is freaking perfect. <laughs> <laughs> like, how'd you meet Danik? So like like I said, you know, we grew up together, and as I got, but I'm older, saying after the, what I'm saying is growing up together is one thing, but like, how did you reconnect with him? So we always kept in touch, and okay. you know, I, I work when I did work for BMW. Um, I mean, pretty much every year after my second, third year, I was always in top rankings for hours sold, top rankings for customer uh, satisfaction index, right. which is huge at a dealer, you know, because sure. usually you either have high sales and low low customer satisfaction sure. or low sales and high customer satisfaction. Right. So every year I, I pretty much hit high sales and also customer satisfaction. So people were spending with me and they enjoyed it. So Danik tried to steal you? No. I mean, we, we were always boys and I would always stop by the shop when I finished work and, you know, we were hanging out so on the happened? weekends said, and we were he traveling. Said, well, he said, I want you to come work for me or what? You know what it was? We, uh, we put ourselves together one day and, and we we're like, you know what? The, the two of us together would be unstoppable. Yeah. We, we, we'd, so we'd how long you been it. with Danik? 
So we partnered up uh, about four years ago now. Four. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And you mean, run the dealer division. Yeah. So you know the main fo- I help at the shop. Um, you know his main focus is the shop. My main focus is our guys on the road. We have thirty eight guys that thirty eight guys that, that don't, do what that don't come to the shop. They do what they just go to dealers. They're doing detailing. They're doing uh, paint corrections, ceramic coatings, window tinting. Uh, Expel, that's PPF. Crazy. That's awesome. And so it didn't start that way. You 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 came in to Danik. You all of a sudden said, "I'm going to get my first dealership." Tell me, walk me through do, the first. Do you dealership. know? How, do you know how? I, God's honest truth. Swear to God. Do you know how Donick and I actually decided that we were going to get together and do something? No. He came back from the conference with you. I swear on my from mother. From me? From you. Get the hell out of here. He goes. I met this fucking guy. <laughs> he goes. This guy put a spark under my ass. He's like, I'm telling you. With with his with, with what I've learned, we can take this business and we can morph it with all your because you know working through BMW uh, for so long, I met a lot of a lot of high people. I went to a lot of interviews, even though I never left BMW. Um, so I had a ton of connections, and my mom's been in the car business, you know, for for thirty years now. So she has a ton of connections in the area too. He came back and he was like, he's like, bro, we're gonna morph the the paint protection film market out here. And he was like, we're going to do it together. And I was like, all right, that sounds good. I'm in. Let's do it. That's amazing. Yeah. I didn't know you that. You didn't know that. I had no idea. You know, when I realized it, too, it was when I was sitting on the couch before when you were when you were interviewing with him. And I'm like, holy shit, I remember when, I remember when Donna came back from conference and he was like, I met this maniac, <laughs> Mike Burke. And he's like, we're going we're gonna to change the game. You're making me cry. No, it, it's God's honest truth. And... Um, we did, man. We, we we went into business, and a lot of businesses, you know, take year, two years to become yeah. profitable. Right. I yeah, mean, we're profitable right out of the gate. We we hit the we hit the ground running strong. That's awesome, man. And, and you put the spark under his ass, which put the spark under mine. And uh, I met you the next year at conference, and uh, you know we immediately hit it off too, and you know became family. But that that's that's what set it off, man. That that's what that's what uh, you yeah, know. I, it's I, crazy. I I left the. A nice job at BMW, making two hundred grand a year, and we said we're going to do it. And uh, you know, we uh, we mainly service five dealers, but in the area, you know, between random work and piece work here and there, we probably touch between you know ten to fifteen stores. We do a lot of corporate accounts now, um, you know, for for headquarters, um, you know, a lot of the press cars and stuff that go out, and uh, it's just. It's been rolling, man. We we got no. You work hard, bro. Like you work hard. What kind of car do you have? Uh, right now I have an M5, and I got a backdraft. I got a backdraft Shelby Cobra. Does anybody know what a backdraft Shelby Cobra is? This car is absolutely a replica of the Shelby original car, right? Yep, nineteen sixty-five. You custom designed this car. You made it. Like they made. How long did it take to make this car? Like you ordered it, and it was like eight, nine months, a year. What did it take? Uh, that one took about six months. To six come in. months. It was like a hundred ten you, you, grand or something. You, you pick everything. I mean, it's you know, amazing. That it's car painted is painted in a Lamborghini color. This car is amazing. Like it's beautiful. Put a coyote motor like, in do it. Do you like driving it? I love it. It's a, it's a blast. It's the, a blast. It's uh, it's. If a lot you're of a car fun. guy, that's that's the car down. It, it's a cool car. Everybody loves it. I don't I, care if you're a, 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 a Italian car lover or if you're American car lover. Everybody loves this car. Like everybody, it's just unique. It's it's fun. You're you're you feel like you're driving a go kart on the. Isn't road. that funny? What's the horsepower on that car? So with the Coyote motor, it's got about 520 horsepower, but the car only weighs like 1,200 pounds. Nah, it's uh, it's 2,200 pounds. So it's 2,000 pounds. Yeah. What's the average car weigh? I mean, I don't know. 4,000, 5,000 pounds. What's your M5 weigh? Probably 4,500 pounds. And it's got know. how many horsepower? The M5's got uh, about 650, so this has, you know, 100 less horsepower and weighs half. Half as much. Yeah. So it's like power to weight. Boom. And, and, will, the, and will the Coyote motor beat the M5? Um, you should drag them. You should go out there and drag them. It, it would be interesting. That'd be fun. Yeah. Get Danny to drive one of them. It, right? it would be scary for the person driving the Cobra, <laughs> but... But, uh, no, nah, man, I, I, I appreciate you coming on the show. I really do. And we're going to go out and have some fun today. I want to get break up this thing so we can get out of here. Definitely. Micah, thank you for uh, taking care of the, the podcast. He's amazing. This dude is a talent times a thousand. Danik, I love you. You're one of my boys. And what's your Instagram? Mike.Polari. Mike.Polari. If you want to see action, fun, exciting, and what your life should be, 
follow him <laughs> on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> and Clear Brock Chris, he works for Expel. He's getting kind of boring. He went corporate on us. So uh, we'll party for him, okay? Absolutely. All right, brother. Hey, I'm going to pour me one more little sip of this. Let, and, me, let uh, me try that as yeah, well. Yeah, you want to try this? I'll, I'll, I'll drink out of one that Clear uh, Brock Chris that, had. Yeah, absolutely. That's fine. This stuff right here is amazing. This is the one he likes. This is the one he likes. This is the Samurai Scientist. And uh, taste, we'll taste some whiskey together and uh, have some fun. Cheers, brother. And, uh, hey, Happy cheers, birthday. Hey, love you, bro. Thank you for love coming. You. And uh, this is the first podcast. What do you uh, think about this room, man? This is pretty cool, huh? Bro, this room's something else. Isn't that cool? Hey, thanks, guys. We're going to sign off. And uh -huh. um, thanks for having us. And uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>